Hey everybody, welcome to the Pre-Accident Podcast. I'm your loving host, Todd Conklin, and I'm here for the duration. I'm not planning on leaving this one, no way, no how. It's not going to happen, it's just not going to happen. So, I'm calling, uh, no, I'm not calling, what am I doing? I'm talking to you today, because today's a big old podcast that I almost guarantee you're going to like. If you've liked the other ones, this one's going to knock your socks off. I'm going to introduce you to a gentleman by the name of uh, Shane Bush, T. Shane Bush, and some of you are going to know Shane, and others of you aren't, and all of you should. Shane is a long time, very highly experienced, incredibly capable uh, human performance facilitator, as he calls himself. And what he really is, is an early, early adopter and an early thinker and a super, super good friend of mine, long term friend. We've been friends a long, long time. Shane and I have taught together a bunch. I couldn't even ask him this question in the middle of this podcast to how many people he thought he had taught. And as soon as I asked it, I thought, God, that is just the meanest question to ask somebody. Because I don't even, I mean, I don't think I could, I don't know that. I I couldn't answer that for myself. I couldn't even, I'd have to just make something up, which is kind of what he did. You'll hear it. I mean, he's a lot more polite than I am and not as big of a a giant fat liar as I am. But uh, he's really interesting. And he's going to specifically talk today about his definition of human error. And you know that we've talked about this before, and we'll continue to talk about it, because this is really important. But what Shane has to say about error, every single company in the world needs to hear. Uh, Seriously, this podcast is so valuable, I almost guarantee that this podcast will change the discussion you have with your leadership. And if you're out there really struggling, and some of you guys are, at ways to think about getting this new view into your factory or onto your production floor, into your organization, this is a really, really important podcast to listen to. Because Shane's going to tell you, really, in a very boiled down, incredibly elegant version, what really matters. And what matters is this notion that error is normal, error is not choice, and that it will never go away. You manage it, you understand it, you hear it. Now, if you remember Tony's podcast that you just heard, he talks a lot about this notion of identifying critical steps. Shane talks more about how to think about managing, not error, because error is really normal, but managing processes around error. He's going to talk about just culture. He's going to talk about accountability. He's going to talk about culpability. He's going to talk about leadership. He talks about all the crap that everyone asks about all the time. And he does it in a very elegant little podcast that you're going to like a lot. So without much ado, and be ready, because we did have some technical difficulties on this one. Um, We'll get through it. But I left some of it in because I think it's interesting for you to kind of hear how things play out. So without much further ado, the Pre-Accident Podcast proudly presents the incredible... The indomitable, indubitable, amazing Shane Bush. Listen carefully. You're going to love what Shane has to say. I'm still surprised how small the circle is. It's, it's obviously growing. Um, I'm hearing more and more names. But still, it, it hasn't uh, exponentially grown like I thought it would as far as people trying to get a piece of this pie. Um, I'm still quite often at conferences and stuff as I scan through the biographies and, and who's presenting it still seems to be a, a pretty small niche deal, which is pretty amazing. Still a lot, a lot of work out there. I think it's incredible, actually. It, I'm like you. I can't believe more people haven't started doing this. But And I think the reason is, Shane, is because it takes such a long time to learn how to do this. Well, you know, I think you're exactly right. And if you remember in the early days for both of us, it I, I think back of how I must have explained things and how I must have talked about different graphs and stuff, and I and, and I kind of laugh because I wonder what the heck I even said. But but I think what most people it, that, that to me it it sounds good. It really does sound good, and I think it is good. But it's not nearly as easy to implement as you would think. Um, now I've done it long enough. Now I I can't see where. Why it's so hard, you know, I'm not a good one to ask because 
after having done it so long, you, you can easily go through a mental process in your head. You know, I'll do, you should be doing this, this, and this. And even when you explain it and show it to them on paper, for some reason, the philosophy is always accepted, but the implementation, it just tends to be very tough. I, I agree. It's really interesting. I got a feedback when I started these, uh, these podcasts, these goofy little yeah. podcasts, by the way, thank you so much for this. Oh no, this is cool. And one of the, one of the pieces of feedback I got is, uh, why are you calling it the new view? Um, we've been doing it for almost 10 years. And yeah. I, th I thought, well, you know, that's actually a really good comment for those of us who've been doing it a long time. It's not a new view, no. but to the rest of the world, it's pretty stinking new. Yeah. You're cutting out a little bit on me. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, I'm fine. Um, I, I, I'll be honest with you. Even 10 years to me is a really long time to, to understand a philosophy to the depth that I think this has the potential. Definitely. How, how's your, are you at home? Is your internet good? Yeah. Yeah. I got real good strength. Everything looks good on this end. How am I coming across sound wise? Good. Um, you sound amazing. Like, uh, I don't know, like if, when angels sing, that's what you sound like. That's how good you sound. <laughs> oh, man, I can't wait to hear this back then. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just breaking up a little tiny bit. So what I'm going to, yeah, I'm getting the same thing. Just, what, it's just little tiny seconds, but yeah, I, I actually lost you for a long time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to call you right back. So let's hang up and I'll call you right back. You got it. I, I think it's my end that's screwing up. So hold on. Well, Quick callback, and here's part two. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Oh, I think we're good. I think we're really good now. Okay. So, <clears throat> so and it, it might might have been my end because you know I'm a, I'm out here in the desert where things are crazy. <laughs> so so let's go back to this idea of of people haven't picked up on this. Why do you think more people aren't out teaching this this uh, information? I. I... My experience has been that there's a lot of people that want to do this and have approached me about doing this, but it's what we talked about before. I think two things. One of them is it's a lot more of an effort to uh, learn and understand this philosophy to the extent that you're comfortable standing up and facilitating courses and answering questions. And I think also that um, sometimes it's a matter of chance. I, I think that part of my opportunity was I was in the right place at the right time and the timing was good. As you know, when you and I first started this in DOE, it was such a fresh idea that um, we had a, a this huge opportunity in front of us. Now that it, at least within the DOE world, now that it's been out there a while, I, I don't know if it's exposed to this to some level or another, but take a, take away the DOE part. I think the reason a lot of companies um, or individuals who want to implement this hesitate, in order for someone to truly give you their attention and believe that you have something credible, you, you have to bring one of two things to the table, either credentials like you, your PhD, and, and could show an arm length of credentials and really academia-wise have got it nailed, or you, you have to rely on the other side, which is the approach I brought to the table, which was... Uh, nose to the grindstone implementation. I honestly didn't go out, and I don't even think I met you until after we had gone through the hard knocks of trying it once and and learning some uh, hard lessons and then training it again. And and some people don't have the fortitude to see it through uh, because it sounds so good. And and if you do it correctly, it, it sounds easy, um, but you've really got to want it. And quite often. The biggest mistake I see individuals make is when they go back, they think that everybody else is going to have the same level of desire or interest that you do, and because I did, um, and I found out in a hurry that while most people are really interested in the philosophy, when you actually start talking about implementation, you lose interest in a hurry. Oh, I hear you, and 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 I'd repeat what you said even louder and clearer that the the biggest mistake I've made personally is the assumption other people have the same level of knowledge I do or the same level of understanding that I do. Not that I'm saying I have a high level of understanding. And, no, then, I understand. and then I think the other thing we really mess up on is I don't think we give enough time to senior leadership. And I think they need even more fundamentals training than the workers need fundamentals training. What do you think about that? 
if you forced me into a corner and said, Shane, you can you can only do one of two. You can do what we typically refer to as physical plant touchers or workers, and and uh, it still could be the scientists and all that, or senior management and leadership. Definitely, I would pick senior management and leadership. Um, recently had an opportunity at Fermilab. There was enough interest expressed by the employees, and I believe enough feedback to their senior management that, hey, if we're having to do two or three days of this, why aren't you? So they actually brought me in for the lab director and all of his reports over a weekend because they couldn't find two days free um, and and actually took them through the whole process in a couple of days. And the feedback from the employees was phenomenal. As a matter of fact, there was a couple of letters sent that I read after the lab director had gone through it stating that he actually had no clue the level of um, – integration that this can take place in the scientific world and I my my biggest uh probably reward or as far as experience uh, my biggest aha moment is when I finally realized that this was a business initiative at its best for companies that if you get the right people in the room and they listen to the message a lot of people bring you in under the safety umbrella or they have an event and, and that's very common but if you truly listen to the message and you're, you're uh, business savvy at all, you will understand this affects procurement, this affects engineering, this affects reputation of the company, everything. And that's senior leadership, right? And so, yeah, if I was forced into a corner, I would definitely say I would, uh, if, I, you, if you could get them on board, it would naturally take care of a lot of the issues, not all, but a lot of the issues that stand in the way as hurdles in implementing this philosophy. Take me through your background a little. So two questions. One, when did you start actually teaching fundamentals of human performance? Do you remember the year? You know what? I remember not only the year, I remember the day I looked at this stuff. It oh, was let's about... hear it. Let's hear it. <laughs> well, what's interesting is my story is I was heavily involved in voluntary protection program at the Idaho National Lab. And for anybody who's familiar with that, as soon as you achieve star status, which we did in May of 2001, um, you're immediately required in order to maintain that to continually improve. So believe it or not, the day I got on site and handed us our gold star, um, and we were the only ones to get a gold star, which they eventually took back and said, well, we're just going to give you a star. But nonetheless, I was handed a package of this stuff called human performance. Never heard the term before. And honestly, it was provided by INPO, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with INPO, Inter um, Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. And it just, the slides resonated with me. And Todd, that's unusual. I, I usually have to hear a message or watch a presentation to really get the depth. But I could tell just by looking at those slides, there was something to this. And so I immediately... Um, got approval from my management to visit INPO at uh, Farley Nuclear Power Plant uh, south of Atlanta to go through uh, one of their courses. And when I brought it back to the INL and told them what I thought about it, that's when it all began. So it was the spring of 2001. Um, what was interesting is exactly what you said a few minutes ago. Senior management sent me. I went and learned it, brought it back, and they said, now take all the employees through it not realizing what they were asking me to do or what the philosophy truly had the potential of. So we made all the usual mistakes. We trained all the employees on air precursors and latent conditions and organizational weaknesses, most of which the employees had little to no control over, <laughs> but they were well aware of it now. And so <laughs> That's uh, funny. that caused, yeah, it, it caused us to have to kind of regroup and in our implementation plan, which we shared with many, many sites afterwards, if we, we went back to the basics, just like Impo suggested. Senior management's got to be on board. And once we did that, we started to thrive um, at least a lot more than we had in the past. And and then after teaching with you and running around the DOE complex for a few years, um, I'm sure the same happened to you. I don't know that you and I have ever actually had this conversation, but I was getting a lot of requests from companies to come in, but I couldn't because it was copyrighted material, as you're aware, when it was Impo. And when DOE decided to put the DOE stamp or name on the cover and made it public domain, that's when my world really opened up and allowed me to teach this not as an info process, uh, even though I gave them credit, 
certainly for the development of it, but it was related or communicated as a Department of Energy process. And then it went from Cirque du Soleil to Schwann Foods to ending up in England and Italy and China and all over the place. Uh, I'd have never imagined the companies and the places that my wife and I have been with this. And, and, the, and I need to mention that, that uh, my wife actually owns Bush Co. Incorporated, which is our small little company. And we did that on purpose because we wanted to travel and work together. And she takes care of all the logistics. I take care of all the uh, in front of the room facilitation. And it's just been a, a, a perfect marriage of business and of an actual marriage um, for us as far as traveling. And, and again, I think the reason is because the message, the biggest reward for me is going into a new company. I, I do like working with companies repeatedly uh, over time. I have some customers I've had for 10 years. But there is nothing more rewarding than going into a company who's never heard the words and listen to the philosophy. And it's almost like you can actually see light bulbs going off right above their heads because <laughs> it just resonates so well. Um, and the niche, as you can imagine, when you talk about human error, it applies to every person, which means it applies to every business, which means it applies to every industry. So I think the best years, and this is my personal opinion, but the best years of human performance are about 10 to 15 years out from right now. I agree completely. How, it's many, when, how many people you think you've taught? Fundamentals, just fundamentals. How many people? Todd, I, I, I honestly, the only thing I could tell you, it's in the tens of thousands. Um, I don't know an exact number. I And as you know, there's one day fundamentals. And then I usually am on the road teaching my practitioner course. Practitioner courses definitely in the thousands. I don't know if I can claim tens of thousands, but I wouldn't be surprised if you counted up every person who sat through some form of my presentation if I'm not pushing a hundred thousand. Well, I, uh, have, I have to tell you, it's a super unfair question because I couldn't even, I wouldn't even know where to start to answer yeah. that question. I would, I'd have to make stuff up. Well, and 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 that's why I hesitate as well. If if you think of all the different opportunities you both you and I have both had with keynotes and. And, uh, you know, management presentations that are maybe two to four hours. Although, I'll be honest with you, um, I've been doing it long enough now that if I get an opportunity for just a one-hour overview for senior management or a 30-minute overview, I usually deny the opportunity because what I find with human performance is you can do more damage than good with really short presentations. Amen, brother. I, in fact, I'm the same way. I won't do a one-hour. I won't do a two-hour and I just tell them, you know, I'm, I won't do it. If if you want it, that's fine. You need to find someone else. I'm not going to be your guy. And what I find, and you tell me if this isn't true, Shane, is managers, once they go through some form of the training, they think they're inoculated. In fact, they say things like, well, I've already had that training. Well, yeah. okay, that's not the training. That's a one-hour exactly. overview. Isn't that sad that that, that, and that's true of, I think, any initiative is, I've had some managers, because we also do human error investigations, where I've interviewed them and asked them, are you familiar with human performance? Now, they said, oh, absolutely. But when I actually start getting into a little bit of the details in a very respectful way, um, honestly, their level of understanding was regurgitating a few terms like air precursors and latent condition. The, one of the best experiences I've, I've ever had is a company – uh, up in Butte, Montana, Northwestern Energy, who decided to turn this into a business initiative to where the CEO on down all went through the practitioner course. And the first and only time in my career I've been invited to present to the board of directors. And I think the reason that that was such a rewarding experience is because they truly understood this as a business initiative. And and here's what they, they truly understood. And, and if you can truly understand this one thing, about human performance, it'll put you light years ahead of most companies. And that is, uh, we, we talk latent conditions, latent organizational weaknesses, all these latent terms, and we all know that they are hidden and lie dormant, et cetera. But if you can understand the analogy that James Reason gave, that latent conditions are to companies what resident pathogens are to the human body, meaning that they'll always be there. You'll never get rid of them. Now, there's some obvious things. If the tool doesn't work, fix it. If the procedure's wrong, correct it. But if you can honestly understand that these things will always be there, so we need to manage them. We don't reduce human error to zero. We want to reduce it, but you'll never, as we know, get it to zero. So if you can manage 
the human error or more more succinctly manage the consequences of human error. I've heard a lot of quotes and I've read a lot of quotes where it said that human error is a symptom of trouble deeper inside. I know Decker and others use that. My quote would actually be the consequences of human error is symptoms of trouble deep inside because human error doesn't go away. Even in high reliability organizations, they have a same error rate that, that uh, normal average companies. But what they've done is they've been able to manage human error with defenses. And, and when they truly understand that, then all of a sudden peer checks, self checks, independent verifications, all these tools take on a whole new light as to their importance in everyday activities. The important thing about that, though, Shane, is that's a, that's a level of understanding and a level of maturity that you aren't naturally born with. You have to sort of work your way intellectually into that thinking. In fact, one of the things I would tell everyone listening to this today is that there's going to be a time in your career where air is not terribly interesting. It's so normal that it's right. not very important. Right. That's a pretty bold thing to say, man. You, you know, it is. And and honestly, um, one of my slides that I always present, but never until about the second hour, never in the first hour, is our goal is to not reduce air rates to zero. Our goal is to reduce the consequences of errors to zero. And by the way, most errors we don't even care about. Yeah, exactly. It's, how, it's how, just how, those that could give you heartache. In fact, I've developed my own criteria, and that is, the errors that we focus on with all the tools is any error that could either result in injury, which is safety related, interrupt the mission or reputation of the company or the lab, so it's mission related, or do damage to facility or equipment. I think by narrowing it down to those three criteria, and those are just mine, and they're not absolute, people can obviously develop their own, but it takes this huge philosophy and allows you to wrap your arms around it. Yeah, that's a brilliant idea. And the podcast that's before yours, so the one last week that everyone listened to, Tony, uh -huh. Tony Mashara talks about critical processes and critical steps, and he has a really sweet, very clean definition. Anything that has immediate, um, non-recoverable, that's the key word, non-recoverable harm to the asset or the facility, the values, the program, the, the project, he calls the critical step. And that's where he's, oh, there you go. he manages kind of the highest level of protection. So I think that that's a really, really important message. What, what do you think? Well, th so this is a tough question, but you're a really good person. You've been doing this a really long time. And so you've got lots of sort of experience under your belt. What do you think is the hardest hurdle to cross to get a group of people to sort of understand this new view? Um, well, we need to talk about the elephant in the room, or at least that's what I refer to as the just culture. I mean, obviously the just culture is always, I don't want to use an absolute there. The just culture is usually one of the biggest hurdles, but aside from that, because everybody talks about, that's a known fact. You've got to have a culture where people report. So let's assume that you've overcome that. So hold on, hold on. Let me interrupt you a minute. Yes. So when you talk about just culture, because one of the things I'm noticing is that just culture has about a million meanings. It and does. I think that's killing us. So your definition yeah. of just culture is? My definition of a just culture is honestly a culture in which a company thoroughly and the employees thoroughly understand the difference between accountability and culpability, which there's a whole new conversation right there. And that people understand and are accountable for their actions and behaviors, but the company is also fulfilling their part in if it truly is an error, which you'd need to define and make sure your company agrees on, that you are not necessarily held culpable or, in other words, punished for that. So if it's truly an error, and by the way, a lot of times I have companies that say, well, what about repeated errors or people that seem to make the same error again and again? Well, again, if the error is not, by Tony's definition, a critical step, then who cares, right? At yeah. least to some extent. I'm no, exaggerating. I agree. I agree completely. Big deal. But if it it's is normal. A critical, yeah, if it's a critical step and they've made numerous errors, then you should have put defenses in place requiring them. I, I always use the example, an employee backs into a propane tank. Didn't mean to, but backs into a propane tank. First time, there's not going to be culpability. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about defenses. Second time he backs into it and I had put defenses in place like cones or somebody needs to watch as they back up. 
I guarantee you, I'm not going to ask him about the error. I'm going to ask him about, did you use my process? Because if they were aware and did not use my process, there's going to be culpability. Again, not for making the error, but for not following the process. So here's my down to earth definition of accountability. The company's part is to educate you, introduce you to the tools, introduce you to the definitions, the employee's accountability, use the tools, use the tools, use the tools. And if you don't, then you need to be held culpable or at least potentially culpable depending on which tree. If you truly have that all agreed upon and being used, that's a just culture. Nice. Nice. And that's and that's that was helpful I think because Gosh, it's just gone crazy out there. It's gone crazy. So I interrupted you right back to the elephant in the room, just culture. What do you think it is, the big the big hurdle that people have to cross? Well, I think it's – and it's interesting enough, Todd. For me, it's, it's basics. It's the understanding of what an error truly is. And I know there are numerous definitions. And I'll be honest with you, I've listened and I have great respect. Some of the names you've named, Tony Mascheria was my um, – first exposure in a classroom and I still am very impacted by Tony and have been very grateful for what I heard and still am to this day. Decker, when I read Decker's book, man, I, it, it changed my view as he intended. It. Um, but I have to say that it's the basic understanding of an error. I actually define an error a little different than I think a lot of the academia do. My definition of an error is uh, something you didn't intend to do. Now, a lot of people would argue that, but honestly, if you think about it in its most basic form, the average worker can get that. An error is something I didn't intend to do. I didn't intend to mix the chemical that way. I didn't intend. And and here's the biggest hurdle is separating error from outcome. I start my classes by asking people, what is an error? What's your personal opinion or definition? If your 10-year-old kid came home from school and said, hey, mom, hey, dad, what's an error? What is an error? And you're right. I get everything from it's an accident. It's an incident. It's it's a, an unwanted outcome. It's uh, but truly you have to separate them. You have to separate the error from the outcome because you can make errors and have good outcomes. 3M has made millions of dollars doing that. You can have errors that have little to no outcome, which is most errors. But if you truly understand that the errors we're going to talk about are those related to critical steps or what I refer to as unwanted outcomes, uh, then you've, again, narrowed the focus of this philosophy to the point where it's usable. And even though I oversimplify it, and I do believe that's an oversimplification, I, I do it consciously to get people started. Once they understand the real basics, they will naturally progress academia-wise or understanding-wise of errors may be a little more than just something you didn't intend to do, but I honestly purposely take them back to that very basic building stone. And if I can get them to understand that and that latent conditions and latent organizational weaknesses never go away, you just manage them through uh, controls, then you're off and running. So so this is really important. And I mean, I, I think I even simplify more than you do because I've really become interested in the fact that air is not choice. And to me, by saying air is not choice, you remove blame to me. And, and I'd be curious what you think to me. The biggest hurdle is not the definition of error. It's the fact that they believe blame is really, I think you have to talk about blame before you can talk about error. Um, I absolutely agree with your, your, uh, your um, definitions. Now, as far as in order, I'd have to give that some thought to, to know whether I agreed or disagreed with that. Um, I've had many companies, believe it or not, when I've introduced them to, for example, the the culpability tree, whichever one you want to choose, um, actually say, you know, we want to do this, but we really don't want to get into that culpability blame, you know, and it's almost like saying we really want this car, but we're not really interested in the wheels and tires. <laughs> and and so you got a carload of people that are enjoying the stereo and they're enjoying a lot of things in the car, but they're not really going anywhere. <laughs> and it's sad um, b- because there are certain building blocks to a true implementation of human performance that are necessary. And I do believe that addressing the just culture is one of those. Now, again, I know that there's many, many opinions, including mine, that are thrown around out there. 
but but if you're at least addressing it, then you're you're working towards it. And I, I think, like Decker said in his book, you never actually arrive. You, you're always going to be working on this. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, we call that were, we call that job security, Shane. Well, there you go. I mean, you're you're always going to be improving. And in fact, I loved it. And I can't remember if it was Decker or Reason's book where I read that as you get older, your error rate actually doesn't change much throughout your life. But you make a lot less critical errors. In other words, you become wise. You become and, – and my biggest joke in class is if you truly want to overcome a company problem, there's got to be a minimum of two people on the team, someone young, energetic, someone that uh, – brand new, new thoughts, new ideas. In other words, someone who still has hope in life. And then you match them up with a, someone who's been around the corner, been there for a year. It's got some uh, years under the belt, and they can somewhat uh, help um, with the implementation from lessons learned perspective because we've all got kids or relatives or nieces and nephews that are making decisions, and you're wondering how in the world do you think that's okay? But the only reason you can think that is because you've been there or done that. <laughs> that's the maturity path that companies take. I love the idea of not having hope anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that's just yeah, me. I, well, and, and, and again, I do it in a very humorous way, but as with all humor, it doesn't work unless there's some sort of truth, right? Injected Amen. Amen, brother. Amen, so brother. There is a little level of truth to that, that you do have to have someone that hasn't uh, become so cynical that they're not really wanting to play your game anymore, but yet still have someone on the team that's been around the block so you're not repeating the same old errors and mistakes as an organization that you have in the past. Are you shocked by how many uh, companies have become interested in this? I have. Uh, honestly, Todd, it, 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 uh, if you'd have asked me 10 years ago, when I first, you know, I think I visited you, what, within the first 12 months of me getting into this, whatever it was. Yeah, so let's, but, let's, let's interrupt a minute to say, let me ask you a question. I'll come right back to this, yeah. I promise. Can you train your own leadership team? And I you know, want to I want to ask that question because I want to tell a story. So yes or no? Can you train your own leadership team? Okay, if you're forcing me into a yes or no, and I'm a local person there, I'd have to say if you forced me, the answer is no. I agree. So here's yeah. my story. Do you remember when when we brought you into my company? Yep. To do the initial training because yep. you can't be a profit in your own company. Right. <laughs> I, I think the old 50 mile rule or whatever the rule is, you have to be so many miles away from your home to be considered an expert. I find that so interesting because I've actually, I think you and I have passed each other on the airplane, headed to each other's laps because they won't listen to us. It's very true. That's well, the, that's a very, ladies and gentlemen in the audience, that is a very true story that Shane just told. <laughs> yeah. And in a sense, it's interesting because, and, and I'm still working at the Idaho National Lab. I mean, I don't know if most people know that. I'm still tied to the lab. I'm, I'm on a professional leave and have been for 10 years, but professional part-time leave, I should say. But still to this day, uh, I'm a rad contact that worked at the Idaho National Lab. I mean, people, and, and I enjoy that. I actually enjoy the, uh, um, being anonymous to most of the lab employees. But yet when I fly around and I'm introduced as a keynote speaker, um, I have the pleasure of both worlds. I have the pleasure of coming to work and doing routine stuff and not having to worry about being on the stage all the time. But at the same time, I also had the pleasure of doing keynotes and being recognized for having some level of experience or knowledge in this uh, arena of human performance. So it's really been a very, very enjoyable trip. Don't you think that grounds you in practicality? I mean, it makes you – you never get far away from the pointy end of the stick. I mean, you, you know what it feels like to be a worker because you work. Right. And I think the minute that you think you personally have this whole HPI thing figured out and you know it all, then you're walking on thin ice. So what's cha- what if, what do you teach differently now that you uh, you uh, taught stupidly back in the old days? <laughs> well, honestly, the first thing that pops into my head, and, then, and there's a list, and I could go through them, but I know this is limited in time. But honestly, I think the thing that um, I have really studied and tried to do a lot better job in explaining is the performance modes. A lot of companies have actually dropped the use of that because it was so confusing to people and they couldn't see the use of it. But I truly believe that if you are going to have a corrective action program that addresses human error, you have to understand performance modes and the related error modes. I I truly believe that. In fact, if you're nothing but fact-based, and and you know my big thing is context. 
uh, if I ever do write a book, and you and I someday got to get to that, um, my big thing, and I push it a lot in class because it's, it's on my license plates of all my vehicles, is context. If you are nothing but fact-based in your assessments, I can almost guarantee you, almost, guarantee you that 50% of your corrective actions, you'd have been better off in doing nothing. Because inevitably, when, when my wife and I come in and do investigations and get the context, in other words, interview people and ask them, just like Decker says, what were they thinking? What was the inside of the tunnel view? What did they know at the time? It made perfect sense to them to do what they did, knowing what they knew at the time. And that is a significant aha moment. But too many people read the reports, read the outcome already have uh, determined the cause before they do the interviews. And it's like, how do you do that? I, I don't read anything before the interviews. I don't even want to know what happened other than two guys turned the wrong valve. That's the, that's the most I want to know because it biases you. It biases you. It biases you. I, I truly believe that. I agree a hundred percent. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Context is everything. And the crazy thing is that facts are really negotiable based upon context. That, you know, that's a really good way of putting it. They are. It's, so even facts aren't facts without context. Now, and, and I need to, to add on just because I know people really are into facts. I do not put context. In other words, I do not put their view of the tunnel in my report and verify the indicators are what they said or the communication or the environment, whatever it may be. And so if you pushed me into the corner and said, well, it sounds like you're taking context and actually eventually ending up with facts. I would actually accept that. I, it's just the way you go about it. it. It's, and by the way, with all the studies my students have done at the University of Idaho, uh, under our, our certificate program here with HPI, um, we quickly found out that if you get the facts prior to the context, it really, uh, thwarts your of action. It doesn't completely mess it up, but it makes it a lot more difficult to come to the right conclusions. So the order in which you receive information, facts versus context, I have found to be critical in getting to corrective actions that are truly going to help you resolve the issue or problem you have, you're having. I agree completely. I, I completely agree. So, so what's the one piece of advice you'd give to anyone listening who wants to really push their company into this new view. And and it's important we remember, I think, that this is really hard to do and that lots of these people out in the world are really running up against some pretty strong resistance. You, you know, people really want to hold on to this old way, even though the old way sucks and it's right. not making them better. They and, and so lots of these people are just fighting their heads off to get anybody to even listen. Yeah. What, what would you tell them to do? Honestly, again, it's back to that aha moment. If you somehow can set it up to where you can have your management experience the understanding of all these latent conditions and organizational weaknesses and things and that they don't have to fix them all because that's a huge misinterpretation of human performance is you're out there looking at things. Quite often, I'll, I'll hear managers make comments like that had nothing to do with them turning the valve. Why are you talking about a procedure on procurement. Why, why are you looking into all these different areas that had nothing to do with the fact that I had an employee screw up and turn the wrong valve? And, and to some extent, that's what root causes kind of led us to believe is they're trying to prevent similar events. Human performance is trying to prevent any related or unrelated events that could come from these organization weaknesses. But again, to, to try to narrow this down, if they could truly understand that quote that I'd mentioned, that latent conditions are to companies what resident pathogens are to the human body. Your your goal, as far as your body, is to live and die with the being right, being healthy, you know that, rather than getting rid of them because you can't. If you can convince your management, these tools are to help us manage air, not get rid of it, manage latent conditions, not get rid of it. Um, because I think their misinterpretation, at least my experience has been, is when they hear this message, it's like, oh, my gosh. You know what it's going to take to get rid of all these sign issues and procedure issues? And, and that's not what we're saying. I think we've really misled, not intentionally, but I think as human performance practitioners in the early days, at least I was guilty of this, of misleading the leadership into thinking, I'm going to make this list of all these issues and you've got to fix them all. My gosh, that was, that was probably the worst thing we did in delaying the implementation or 
the buy-in is sending that kind of a message because that's not what HROs are doing. They're managing them. They're, de- they're depending against them. They're doing self-checks and peer checks. And by the way, at the same time that their safety is getting better, they're um, getting a lot better in proficiency and they're getting a lot better in production. I mean, the numbers are out there now. There's, there's enough companies outside of nuclear industry that have done this. I've got personal companies now that I have slides I can show you a direct relationship between human performance and the increase in production and safety and efficiency and all the things we talked about. Gosh, that's amazing. That is amazing. Can people contact you? Absolutely. It's Big Todd. At- <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Just, just tell him that. Give him that one. So how do we do? Did we do okay? I think we did all right. So, I can talk to you all day. It's a problem. So if, uh, if people want to hear more, would you be uh, – against doing another one of these or a couple more? Not at all. I, I know that this was, uh, it may be interpreted as somewhat rambling and I didn't mean it to be, but uh, yeah, if you wanted to talk about uh, a specific topic or just more, absolutely. That's, I, you know, I think it's people inter- will want to hear it. I mean, I think people are going to want to hear more. Yeah. I, th- there's nothing like hearing other people's experience. And that's why I loved your podcast because um, even though you and I've been in it a while, and some people that you've interviewed a long time, it's really good to hear other people's perspective. When, when I first came to your lab and, and you guys changed my perspective on a number of things, I can remember that asking questions and why do you define it that way? So anytime that uh, you can have an opportunity of listening to other people's perspective on human performance, we're all better off, I believe. And I just don't think we get enough opportunity to hang out together as a practitioner's group, which maybe is why I, I started I, the podcast. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think the conferences are good, but the conferences are usually one-way communication on a particular subject. I mean, some people are allowed to ask questions in the audience, but honestly, having two people just sit and talk about the good, bad, and ugly, because there is, uh, oh, yeah. It, oh, yeah. it really helps. You're the best, Shane. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, man. I'll, good be, here. I'll be in contact and tell you lots more stuff. But this was great. I think we did a good job. Sounds great. Good talk to you, Todd. Have Take care. Great weekend. See you later, buddy. See you. Bye. Bye. So there you have it. What do you think? I told you this one is going to be amazing, and it was amazing. Um, I think you'll find this one to be as helpful as any that you're going to hear, and it's really the point of doing this entire podcast, to create this conversation and to hear what other people are thinking and to bring you in on that conversation as much as we can. There will be more of this. Big guests coming down the pike, uh, national, international rock stars, if you will, in the high-reliability arena. Uh, are super interested in being a part of this podcast, and so we'll just make that happen. As always, thanks for listening. I can't even tell you how much your time is worth. It's amazing. And I know this one's a little long, but I kind of thought it was better to leave stuff long than it was to cut stuff. Um, Subscribe and get other people to subscribe. That seems to really help. Again, I don't know why, but there's a lot of pressure to have lots of numbers and subscribe. And uh, and if you have questions or comments about this or any other episode of the Pre-Accident Podcast, do not hesitate in... uh, Writing them down on a sheet of paper and, uh, you know, thinking about them. That's that's the best advice I can give you. Uh, until then, as always, keep learning. It's really important. Have lots of fun. And for goodness sakes, be safe. <laughs>